Chapter 66 The Land's Sabbath Leviticus 25, 1-7 And the Lord spake unto Moses in Mount Sinai, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye come into the land which I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath unto the Lord. Six years thou shalt sow thy field, and six years thou shalt prune thy vineyard, and gather in the fruit thereof. But in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land, a Sabbath for the Lord. Thou shalt neither sow thy field, nor prune thy vineyard. That which groweth of its own accord of thy harvest, thou shalt not reap, neither gather the grapes of thy vine undressed, for it is a year of rest unto the land. And the Sabbath of the land shall be meat for you, for thee, and for thy servant, and for thy maid, and for thy hired servant, and for thy stranger that sojourneth with thee, and for thy cattle, and for the beasts that are in thy land, shall all the increase thereof be meat. Leviticus 25, 1-7 we come now to one of the Bible's most important chapters. The Sabbath year has many aspects. In Deuteronomy 15, 1-6, the cancellation of debts among the covenant people is cited. In this text, we have a Sabbath for the land and from the normal routines of work. There can be no harvest for sale, as verses 6 and 7 make clear. Only that which grows of itself can be used for food. There can be no sowing or pruning. In Leviticus 25, the Jubilee chapter, we see the sharp difference between the good society as Scripture sets it forth and the good society of humanists. The Bible sees society in terms of atonement, restitution and forgiveness. These are the means whereby sin is dealt with. Men receive a new status before God by Christ's atonement, they become a new creature by his regenerating power. They apply restitution and, with restitution, forgiveness to all of their relations. As against this, we have a variety of conceptions which either seek to discount sin or see only its endless burden. Those who seek to discount sin cannot escape the fact of guilt. It governs and haunts a sinful society, the burden of sin is a sociological fact. But men want simplistic answers. Jones has written of the common expectation of Confederate troops from Louisiana. Every Louisiana soldier was obsessed with the same goal in 1861, to meet the Yankee invaders in combat and end the war swiftly in a glorious textbook battle. The Romantics, whether they call themselves social scientists, Reformers or statesmen believe in such simplistic solutions to the problems of sin. Freud, in writing on Dostoevsky and Parasite, saw that men turn the burden of guilt into a burden of debt. As Wiseman pointed out, the mental economy of the guilty leads them into self-degradation and humiliation as means of atonement. Without such self-imposed retribution, the unexpiated guilt becomes unbearable. This is clear in the case of Helis Nahais, Satanist, Sadist, Sodomite, and a man who sacrificed countless small boys in his evil rites. The more he plunged into evil, the more he also plunged into debt. He sinned and he punished himself by incurring impossible debts. It is ironic that debt today has its defenders as the way of progress. It would be more accurate to say that our intellectual debts and loans are today the means of pseudo-atonement to bring judgment upon the nations. Believers in karma take sin more seriously, but for them there is no atonement, no grace and no forgiveness. Life becomes a painful cycle of continuing punishment and hopelessness. Life becomes a living death. The many evils of ostensibly previous incarnations add to present ones to produce a life of inescapable guilt and misery. The promise of the Sabbath year is the atonement. Men can rest in the Lord. 
By his atonement they are free. By his law we find continuing renewal for the earth and ourselves in the Sabbath. The fact of the Sabbath remission of debts means that foresight, providence and work govern men for six years and make possible a rest on the seventh. Consider the amount of interest paid by most men yearly. Add to this the interest cost in all goods we buy, since businesses operate on debts and pay interest. Add also the interest paid in taxes on the national debt. The direct and indirect interest we pay out annually would in itself also keep us for the seventh year. The Sabbath year laws are basic to the laws of holiness. They require the cancellation of debts, freedom for slaves, really bond servants, and a rest for the land. What the trees or vines bore in the Sabbath year were to be food for all, so that the poor would, as in gleaning, be allowed to harvest the fields. According to Exodus 23, 9-12, Also thou shalt not oppress a stranger, for ye know that the heart of a stranger, seeing ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. And six years thou shalt sow thy land, and shalt gather the fruits thereof. But the seventh year thou shalt let it rest and lie still, that the poor of thy people may eat. And what they leave the beasts of the field shall eat. In like manner thou shalt deal with thy vineyard, and with thy olive yard. Six days thou shalt do thy work, and on the seventh day thou shalt rest, that thine ox and thine ass may rest, and the son of thy handmaid and a stranger may be refreshed. It is clear from this text that the Sabbath rest must be used to bring the covenant people together in a concern for one another, as well as in a trust in the Lord. Notice that in verse 1 we are told that these laws are a part of God's revelation to Moses on Mount Sinai. This is not a latter addition to the law, but an essential part of it. As Moses set forth the revelation, it came to its culmination in this chapter. Meyrick set forth the meaning of this law thus. The principle is, as before, that as the land is God's land, not man's, so the Israelites were the slaves of God, not of men, and that if the position in which God placed them was allowed to be interfered with for a time, it was to be recovered every seventh, or at furthest, every fiftieth year. As Riley said of God, He not only rules the realm, He owns it. Therefore His law must govern it, and His ordained rest. Moreover, in this sabbatical year God also emphasised dependence upon His providences. A central aspect of the Sabbath year was education in the meaning of God's law. Deuteronomy 31 9-13 9-13 to 13. According to Second Chronicles 36-21, the Babylonian captivity was necessary so that the land might enjoy the Sabbaths denied to it by Israel's apostasy. Seventy years of Sabbaths were kept during that captivity, a year for every skipped year. God's law is not to be trifled with. Rest for the land means its renewal 